The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you. In the 50th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Linatius was tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priest of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John of Zechariah, the son of Zechariah in the desert. John went throughout the whole region of the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one crying out in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The winding road shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Are you ready? Christmas Day, it is but, what, 16 days away? Are you ready? Have you prepared well? Preparation's still underway. Have you ventured out in the wilderness and cut down your tree, or perhaps has ventured into the wilderness of your basement or your attic and fished it out of storage, put it up, decorated it? Have you gotten outside and put up lights around the house? Done any of that? Maybe you got your figurines blown up out in the yard and the like? What else are you doing to prepare? I mean, other than being out in the malls and shopping till you're dropping or spending an inordinate amount of time online doing even more shopping. Do you have seasoned traditions, such as perhaps going to see the, the Nutcracker or maybe Scrooge or something of that nature? Is that in your plans, or have you done that already? Have you been out celebrating, having Christmas parties with family and friends, caroling and the like? Certainly lots of well-wishing going on. I'd like to think that in addition to all this, you're also praying, praying in this season of the before time to have a very Merry Christmas, but all of this, all that we're doing, is it enough? Is it, is it really enough? Because if it were, why do so many people regard Christmas as thankfully over come December 26th? Why is it that that week between Christmas and New Year's we see so many trees out by the trash and lights coming down and People are looking almost rather ill, like having been somewhat bloated over this month of preparation. Christmas begins December 25th. It's not when it ends. What can we do to really prepare well to celebrate and have a very Merry Christmas, not just December 25th, but December 26th, December 27th, December 28th, December 29th, and keep going through at least the whole of the Christmas season. Well, first and foremost, I think we need to ask ourselves, what do we desire most out of Christmas and Christmas season? More than just acknowledging Christ being incarnate there in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, more than just celebrating his divine birth. What do we desire most? Well, we were just told in today's readings, what we desire most is joy, the true joy of the Christmas season. That's what we're longing for, what we are to be preparing for is the joy of the divine in our midst. Great. 
So how ought we be preparing to receive that joy in addition to what we're already doing? Well, I'd like for us all to consider perhaps putting into practice the evangelical councils. Now, just by way of refresher, the evangelical councils are poverty, chastity, and obedience. Three the evangelical councils, of which poverty, chastity, and obedience are not the exclusive domain of the religious, of Benedictines and Jesuits and Redemptorists and Dominicans and Franciscans and the like. The evangelical councils of poverty, chastity, and obedience belong to all of us for the glory of God, for the salvation of our souls. And yet it, it, is, the, it is the evangelical councils of which the world so much despises. The notion of poverty. That's not what we are to pursue in this life. Are we to become one of those destitute souls of which Deacon Frank often talks about ministering on the streets of Seattle? Is that what God really wants for us? Or chastity? I mean, we live in the era of the sexual revolution. Everything is being sexualized. I mean, more than we could possibly have ever even imagined even a generation ago. Or obedience. Even that word obedience, to obey. Well, if it's something other than your thirst, it's seen as coercive, confining, demanding. Really? Well, from the outlook of the world, perhaps, but not from the outlook of God, not for us. Poverty, it's not that notion of being desperately poor and needy, not in the way we think of it, but in a different sense. For the Lord himself said, blessed are the poor, the poor in spirit. Okay, how are we recognizing our poverty of spirit, at the very least, in these days of preparation for Christmas? Are we recognizing our dependence upon God truly for everything in our life? What can we do to really be living out the evangelical counsel of poverty? Perhaps, yes, we can certainly see the poor in our midst and see how we are attending to their needs and, and caring for them. But also to recognize that poverty can take different forms. We can have a poverty of spirits out of our just ignorance of the Gospels. How about picking up the Gospels, especially like Matthew and Luke during this time, and reading once again and praying over once again how the angel Gabriel was sent to that backwater town of, of Nazareth so long ago to that girl Mary to announce that she'd found favor with God. Yes, she was poor, and she was full of grace. That's how we make a straight path for God and us, to recognize we need God truly for everything in our life, the same way children are wholly dependent upon their parents to provide from them. Yeah, we are to really truly recognize how much we are children, and to embrace that with great joy that our loving God provides and cares for us so much. And to find ways and means of trusting in God for everything. Or just the, the poverty we have with our cares and concerns. How much time do we spend every day just worrying, worrying about things? There's a real poverty in that. Handing that over to God during these days of God. God, I surrender my worries to you. I am poor in these areas of my life. I trust in you. Great. That makes straight that path John the Baptist was talking about to God. Or in chastity. Chastity where we cannot turn on the television or go to a movie or go on the internet without being bombarded with sexual nuance or innuendo and the like. 
The sexual revolution has achieved one thing. It has reduced us to mere creatures for amusement and entertainment and pleasure. It has degraded our dignity as sons and daughters of God, created in the image and likeness of God. God made us male and female for the glory of God, to be his very temples. We are sacred. We need to treat each other as sacred. We need to treat ourselves as sacred. How absent I even find that, just being out here on 88th when our high school lets out, hearing the F-bomb dropped right and left. Do not let such profanity come from your lips, for your lips are sacred, and your eyes are sacred. Do not gaze upon that which is foul and profane, that degradates humanity, that objectifies us and reduces us to mere creaturely status. That's what it means to be chaste, to treat each other as sacred. I'm still amazed that people think that being chaste means to be single. No, it doesn't. Being celibate is what it means to be single. All of us are called to be chaste because to be chaste says, I'm sacred and so are you and I'm going to treat you that way and I ask you to treat me that way. That's chastity. Let us practice that in this season. Or obedience. There's something perhaps you don't know about me. I just shared it with the school children this past week. Uh, I actually have the ability to play any musical instrument uh, I set my, my hands to. Piano, I'm, I'm all about that. I play it any, any time, any, whenever I want, wherever I'm at. Uh, the clarinet, I'm, you know, I'm all about that. Tuba, I can do tuba, yeah trombone, drums, I'm wild, just wild on the drums. Really, now you're perhaps thinking, Father, I, I didn't know you were such a savant because I don't think I've ever actually heard you play. Well, I didn't say I can actually play any of them well. You know, I, I don't really know how the score of music, I can't read it all, but who cares? I look at music and I'm thinking, that's just a bunch of rules. I just obey my fingers. So I obey. You know, I don't even know a bunch of rules to play a musical instrument. Well, I, I do actually need to know the rules, and I need to follow the rules of music. Otherwise, I'm not actually making music. I'm making noise. That's what I make. <laughs> to listen to the beauty of music, you're listening to somebody who knows the rules of music and is following the rules of music. Rules don't enslave us, they're meant to liberate us. And obeying uh, the rules of God, the rules of our faith, is not meant to coerce us, it's meant to free us, to live as free sons and daughters of God, to celebrate the glory of God in our midst, living out in accord with his divine plan for us and for our salvation, and helping others to do the same. And where do we arrive at after a, a time and a period of employing the evangelical counsels of poverty and our dependence upon God and chastity and, and our need for God and purity as temples of the Holy Spirit and obedience, following the instructions of God so that we may truly live free? We are filled with joy. That's what happens when we practice the evangelical counsels. We are filled with joy for we have made straight the path to God. And God comes to us for unceasing intimate union. Indeed, we, we arrive at the very experience of Christmas we all desire so much. To be filled with joy. And should we find ourselves in the Christmas season truly celebrating with a joyful spirit, then indeed we can see how we are employing those evangelical counsels because anything less is to become nothing more than a Scrooge or a Grinch before their own conversion. 
Read both those stories again or, or watch them for your sake. Indeed, how many of us feel not unlike them right now, but want to feel like them by the end of the story? Because their story ended where they were filled with joy. We need not make the mistakes they made if we but employ those evangelical counsels to look to God and to surrender to him everything. And when we do, as children, we celebrate the joy and the wonder of the child who came to celebrate the joy and wonder of being one of us.